Well, thank you for being here, uh, and thanks for writing the book uh, of, of so many of them. The it's about the Kerner Commission uh, and the story of the Kerner Commission. Uh, most of the people in this room are old enough to have at least some faint recollection of the echo of the words, the familiarity of the Kerner Commission. But if you, if anyone does know anything about the Kerner Commission, generally all that they really remember about it was that there was one line that came out of its report that said. Our nation is moving toward two societies, one black and one white, separate and unequal. But it's, it's this commission uh, formed by Lyndon Johnson in 1967 at this juncture in American history when for four consecutive years there have been uh, terrible, terrible violence and uh, huge uprisings. There's actually a debate about whether to call these mm -hmm. riots or uprisings or what's the right word to use. Uh, but in that period of time where America's urban centers are in tremendous turmoil around race, and I think in 67, before, by the time the year is over, the summer is over, there have been 100 separate incidents like this around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's this terrible riot that occurs in Newark, New Jersey, begins with the arrest of a black man by two police, white police officers, then beat him uh, in front of a lot of other people. Uh, and this sequence of events begins, at the end of which you've got 40 of the numbers vary a little bit, but 40 or 50 people are dead, 8,000 military police fire officers have been involved, hundreds of people injured, hundreds of people arrested, 2,000 buildings burned to the ground. You know, the, and the prologue of the book is titled, uh, It Looked Like Berlin 1945. You know, so mm -hmm. I think it really captures it. But so then the president commissions, pulls together this classic American phenomenon of the Blue Ribbon Commission, a genuine bipartisan thing. It's got real Republicans, real Democrats on it that really do represent different points of view. Uh, and they set out to tell the president what happened, why did it happen, uh, and how do we make it not happen again? Uh, now, the last 50 years would suggest that the commission's report failed. That's a question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, no. It's, it hasn't necessarily failed. It's one of the th couple of things struck me. You know, when I when I started researching this thing, and I, I, uh, what I was doing is I work for the History Channel, and I do a lot of book documentary projects, and I like doing them that are tied to anniversaries. So, um, I was I just finished a book, and I was sitting on my sofa one day, trying to think of my next project, and I wanted to do something related to 1968, and I am going through all these books, and I was thinking about doing something about RFK, but I, I couldn't find a way in, say something that someone else hasn't already said. And I'm looking up at my television. I'm seeing what's going on in Ferguson. Uh, and I'm thinking, wait, there were riots in 67 and 68. So I, and I thought, well, how about the Kerner Commission? I'm sure there's been a book about the Kerner Commission. So I got online. I found out there was no book written. and the. Uh, the papers are all housed at the Johnson Library. And literally the next day, I flew to Austin and found it's a massive collection of unused material. So, uh, so I went into this um, uh, hoping that by looking at this commission and the riots or... Uh, uh, so Doug was talking about the differences in terminology. So riots is, is the term that we often use, which means that this is just a chaotic, a chaotic event uh, that has no order to it. There's just people who are um, uh, angry and expressing their outrage. An uprising has uh, suggested there's some political meaning to the, to the events, that people are, are uh, rising up against a power structure because there's no other way for them to have a voice. So, so I use the word riot uh, and uprising interchangeably. They actually have different meanings. Um, but um, you know, I was hoping that in some way that I could understand what took place, was taking place now, um, and by looking at what took place in 1967. So, so to get to your question about, you know, it's impossible to look at I mean, I was in, uh, I forget what grade I was in, in 1968. But it's impossible to freeze frame 1968 and freeze frame 2018, despite everything that's going on now, and not see remarkable progress. Um, there's been a, 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 a broadening of attitudes, racial attitudes, especially among those with college degrees. Um, all the legal vestiges of discrimination in Jim Crow have, are, are gone. Um, you have uh, African Americans are 
still underrepresented in the professions and the media, but they still, they're, they're better represented than they were before. Um, and we twice elected an African-American president. Um, so I, I don't think that you can say that it was that, that we've failed in the last 50 years. But I do believe, you know, why, what I argue in the book is that, that there's also, you know, a large African-American middle class now, which did not exist um, in, in 1967 and 1968. But I believe that for those who are left behind in these decaying urban centers, uh, uh, that are, you know, that we didn't have, drugs weren't a problem back in 1968, 67 and 68. Now drugs are, and, and, uh, and guns. Um, so you've had, so for those people who are left behind in these communities, they are actually worse off. They are more separated um, uh, and unequal uh, than they were in 1968. Um, but for the vast majority, for the uh, African Americans, middle class African Americans, I think life is much better. So it's a, it's a glass is half empty or half full. Um, and so I, I would not want to say it's com failed completely, but I also think that we can stop short of patting ourselves on the back. Well, let's go into the, <clears throat> let's talk about the, the actual story of the commission uh, and more specifically what did or didn't happen and then the, we'll circle back to kind of how we assess all this 50 years later. But so in terms of the commission itself, though, you have this horrible, terrible event, uh, uh, though it's also important to remember that, uh, you know, we had the, what happened in Charlottesville a year ago in August. Uh, we've all experienced in recent years all of the many civil disturbances like Ferguson and Baltimore and, and many others go back a little further. You know, we get to the Rodney King riots and as far back as 1992 and things in between. So actually, you know, we have a lot of experience uh, as citizens uh, with these kinds of events. Uh, but it's important to remember that description I was giving a minute ago that's mostly taken from your book uh, that you know we're what happened in Charlottesville a year ago will be sometimes referred to as a riot. Uh, and by a specific definition of riot, it probably fits that. But in terms of the scale of what happened in this event and what had happened in Harlem before it in you know, 1964 and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the, the enormity of what was happening at the time is almost unimaginable to us now. Right. I mean, you have 10 whole blocks. Have you, have you been to Detroit? Uh, yeah, so I was there actually uh, recently uh, for an event, and I, I got a tour of where the disturbances took place, where the riots took place in 67. And there's a whole section of this town that was just hollowed out, burnt to the ground. Uh, you, had, you had tanks um, roaming through the streets of Detroit. Um, I think that as horrible as the events were in Charlottesville, and they, and they, yeah, and they were. Yeah, nothing to minimize that. It's right, right. The, the riots in Newark and in um, and in Detroit were at, on a scale that many of us can simply not imagine. And so the and so it's the natural thing that President Johnson in '67, uh, you know, needs to respond to this in some fashion, some dramatic public kind of way. And so he he creates this commission. Uh, it's in this long tradition of of tradition of commissions at a national level, local level. You know, we've done the blue ribbon panel thousands of times in American democracy. Uh, and, and this is one that, as I said before, seems pretty legitimate in terms of who's on it, the, you know, mm -hmm. who, who's running it. And it has a, uh, it's extraordinarily more bipartisan than anything like it that might would be appointed by an American president today, e either way. I mean, today, if you, have a, if you have a rhino Republican you know, in one spot on a 12-member commission created by Democrats, that's called bipartisanship. Right. Uh, and, but this was a, you know, was a real, uh, real thing. Uh, and, but what were the expectations of it? What were the actual expectations of what was going to come from this, either by Johnson or by the people who were involved? Well, that's a great question. Uh, so what happens is uh, the, 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 it begins in Newark, the riots begin in Newark, and then the, 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 uh, the embers are still burning in Newark when Detroit um, uh, goes up in flames. And Johnson doesn't want to do anything. He doesn't want to say anything because if he says something, he feels that he's, he will suddenly become responsible for it. So his aides are encouraging him um, and even writing drafts of speeches uh, for him, uh, suggesting that, you know, that he needs to, to stand up and call for national unity and, and only the president can do this. And Johnson resists it and resists. And then finally, uh, he gets a call from uh, actually Abe Fortas calls the White House and leaves a message and says, you know, I think you should give a speech. So suddenly Johnson, so Johnson walks into the Oval Office 
on Thursday, I think it's, it is uh, July 27th. He walks in around 9 o'clock in the morning and he says to his aides, I'm giving a speech on national television tonight and I'm going to announce a blue ribbon commission to investigate the riots, which completely caught his staff. There have been suggestions in Congress for commissions, but if you go through all the memos, the people lobbying the president to give a speech, it simply doesn't come up. So in terms of the expectations, what you have is the White House had about 10 hours to set up this commission. They had no idea how it was going to be funded. Uh, Johnson appointed people. There was one guy who was, who was flying back to California, and Johnson appointed him. He found out when he landed uh, <laughs> that he was a member of the commission. So I think that Johnson's view, what happens is the, the people who he appoints, and there's really sort of four main characters. Uh, John Lindsay, uh, the liberal mayor of New York. Uh, Fred Harris, who was then a, um, a moderate to conservative uh, senator from Oklahoma. Uh, he grew increasingly more liberal and progressive as he got older. I bet Fred. Fred is 86 now or so, and I probably met him two years ago. And uh, he just came back from a bicycling tour of Europe. <laughs> uh, he's a pretty remarkable guy. Um, and there was a guy named Tex Thornton, who was a businessman from Texas, uh, made a lot of money in the tech industry, was now in California. And he's the conservative voice in the commission. So from Johnson's, I would say Johnson's point of view was he simply accept, uh, believed that this commission was going to rubber stamp his great society initiatives and that he would use that as leverage when he's trying to get Congress, which Congress is obviously trying to cut back on the Great Society. So he saw this as really a way of adding credibility to what he was already doing. He set aside $100,000 from his uh, emergency president's emergency fund. Uh, and he thought that would pretty much cover it. So what happens is he creates the commission, and especially Lindsay and Harris, like, no, we have to do our own investigations. We have to create field teams, go back to the, the, the areas where the uprisings took place. And so they have a very a bit much larger uh, ambitions for what this commission is going to do. But you also have people like Tex Thornton who believe that they're, they're a riot commission. So their only responsibility is to recommend law enforcement um, uh, measures to uh, control riots in the future. So Johnson's expectations are pretty clear. With the commission, there are different expectations of what the commission is going to be. And there's throughout the, de the deliberations, it's a constant struggle between on the left, Lindsay and Harris, and then Tex Thornton on the right. And the thing is, what, why it was difficult was, they all believed they needed to have a unanimous report. They believed it would not have credibility if it's not unanimous. If a group of people appointed by the president cannot come up with a unanimous recommendation as to what to do to the, for the riots, they thought it would only exacerbate the situation. So they had to come up with a report that everybody would sign on, on, on to. So you had to have the liberal Lindsay, who's calling for a guaranteed national income and, uh, and aggressive uh, changes to law enforcement. And then you have Tex Thornton, who thinks you just have to buy more guns and more tanks. Um, and this becomes the tension on the commission as it goes on over the next couple of, uh, of months. Hmm. Uh, I, I have long-winded answers to questions, so I'm sorry. <laughs> all good, all good. Um, but so then the, we have that struggle between these, you know, these various factions that were Johnson ideologically, or in terms of you know, his approach to things, it really turns out to be in the middle. You know, we, we, we sort of remember Johnson as in this period you know, as, as being the guy who's pushing what's on most to the left, but, but he's, now he's launched this Frankenstein, as some people call the commission. Joe right? Calfano called it the Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, Frankenstein. Um, uh, that now has you know his some of his people on it you know are now trying to pull him even further to the left. There are all these echoes uh, that that relate to our current day politics and the uh, in some of these just the difficulty of of uh, of of any president or any conventional political figure to kind of hold to hold the middle, whatever the middle is, or to, to hold the... Yeah. Uh, uh, is and there the, a middle today? I don't know well, well, that, No, we lost, we lost yeah. it entirely. Except, we'll get to that, yeah. um, and those, some of the other echoes of all this. But so in the end, though, even with this crazy diversion, which you could characterize, you could have titled this as, well, I'm usually good at Insta titles, and I almost had it, but somehow the, 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 this is the birth of the, the war on crime, you know, that the, the text, you know, the voice of the, of the super conservative uh, in fact, you know, there's been a good bit of scholarship lately about how the war on poverty 
converts into the war on crime. Uh, and, the, and the idea that that's, even though the commission arrives at a very different set of messages, and I want, I want you to explain how this law and order guy could agree with some of what was in the, in the end. But he's this voice of what is going to come to prevail in American life for, you know, for up until very recently, this idea that in the end, uh, it is the law and order approach. Uh, it, it is more guns, it's more arrests, it's more incarceration, it is the primary approach uh, of a of federal policy toward the inner city. But, but that's not what prevails here. And instead, you know, the report comes back and says, uh, and says that the, uh, I got the quote here somewhere, but essentially that the, it uses the term white racism, right. uh, that the, the inner city problems are the result of quote unquote white racism. What white Americans have never really understood, but what the Negro can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto, white institutions uh, created it, white institutions maintain it, white society condones it. Um, I mean, if somebody said that today, uh, yeah. that, you know, that, that would be viewed that's as right. a radical, radical yeah. thing uh, and would be, could be, that's all they'd be talking about on Fox News, you know, for two or three days, you know, that somebody <laughs> actually said that. Uh, so how did the law and order guy um, be a unanimous uh, vote for that statement? Well, uh, the, the debates over uh, the role of the police were the most contentious and uh, it almost prevented a unanimous report. There was a last minute compromise that allowed uh, Thornton to, uh, to sign on. So a lot of the success of the commission on this issue and others go, is, is, can be attributed to David Ginsburg. David Ginsburg is a, a, uh, a democratic lawyer going back to the, to the New Deal. He was a democratic fixer. He was a fixer for democratic president. So Johnson pulls him in to, uh, to head this commission. He's the executive chairman and Ginsburg is absolutely brilliant in the way he handles this. There would not have been a United States report had it not been for Ginsburg. So the way he handles Thornton, and, 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 and to some extent Lindsay is, and everyone on the commission, he gives them something. Um, he, uh, uh, he trades um, to, uh, to try to get everybody to sign on. And the other thing is, so these, the, uh, so the commission, the way it's set up is you have the 11 commissioners. And then they create, they had a, a team of social scientists um, headed by a guy named Rob Shello, who's a wonderful, a wonderful guy, um, and his team, uh, most of whom are still alive. Um, and they were, they oversaw the field team. So they sent teams into all of the, uh, not all of them, they carefully chose a handful of riot areas and they sent teams in to meet with local leaders and with business leaders and with some of the activists. And they, this is, I don't know if any of you are planning to write dissertations or write a book, the field reports that came back, uh, which very few people have looked at, are just stunning and shocking. Um, and uh, in the way they describe how indifferent uh, local institutions were. And even the commissioners, Harris and Lindsay went to, I think it was Cleveland, and uh, they walked around, they did a tour and they walked around, they broke off from the official tour and they met people on their own. And they heard about these horrible conditions. They showed, they, they saw where people lived. They saw how schools were dilapidated. Um, and uh, then they met with the city officials that night. And the city officials were like, oh, you know, our blacks love it here. It's the other places that are really bad. And we, we respond to all their problems. And they're like, did, you know, did we just view the same city? Um, so, uh, so what happens is these field reports are intensely critical of the police. Uh, and, uh, and, in, and they show that the one common thread that ran through all of the riots. So they, they ran all these, they tried to figure out, okay, you know, are these people poor? Many of them are not poor. So the whole idea that poverty caused it, they're like, where they're questioning. Um, but the one thing they found out, unemployment didn't tie in, education didn't tie in. The one common denominator that everybody who participated in the riots either was a victim of police brutality or had witnessed police brutality. Um, so that was the one common denominator. Now this comes up through the social scientist to David Ginsburg. And Ginsburg is like, we can't say that. You know, we can't, and, but they, they, in the original draft, the language in the original draft of the report, it went through three separate versions before we got to the final version. The first draft was uh, uh, very critical of the police and the role that they played and, and pointed out that the police actually 
many of these riots were actually instigated by the police, oftentimes by overreacting to what were small incidents. So this creates this huge argument among the commissioners. And what Ginsburg does is very carefully scale it back and scale it back, uh, back through the successive drafts. So that it, the final report, uh, you can even see the languages where he's turning words around to make it less inflammatory. And he's doing all this to make sure he can get not just Thornton, but some of the other conservative members onto the commission. So the final report is critical of the police and makes a lot of recommendations for changes the police can make in order to uh, prevent riots, but also in terms of managing riots once they took place. I mean, these police officers and the, and the, uh, uh, the state police and the, the guard, they, were, they hadn't trained in how to contain groups. This is a whole different way of policing. And they were never taught. Uh, they didn't have, all they had were guns with bullets. You know, they didn't have rubber bullets. They didn't have sandbags. They didn't have lots of other equipment that, that are commonly used in crowd control. So the report recommends that they have all of these things. So it was watered down enough that Thornton could sign on. And what Ginsburg gave Thornton was, in the economic recommendations, he included a lot of Thornton's ideas about free enterprise. Uh, and he vetoed uh, Lindsley's suggestion that they have a guaranteed national income. So, um, uh, so it, again, it's this careful, this, this is a product of careful negotiation. Um, among these different commissioners uh, and guided by the, the hand of an incredibly skilled lawyer um, who was able by changing a few words. I have a lot of, I, I mean, I have a lot of friends who are lawyers, um, including your president, uh, and I'm always impressed by, how many of you are lawyers? Okay. I'm just, I'm impressed by the ability to take something that is inflammatory to one person um, and just without necessarily changing the meaning, just move words around to make it so it has the same meaning, but it's not as inflammatory. Ginsburg's absolutely brilliant at doing this. But this is a process that takes place over months and constant negotiation uh, and intense battles um, among the commissioners to get to this final report. And which, you know, so what, just uh, to get back to Johnson, so what happens is when Ginsburg sets up these commissions, Johnson's getting word that, you know, they're, that they're moving in a different direction than he wanted. The investigation is moving beyond the original charge. Uh, the original charge, right. <laughs> so he's, Johnson's good friends with uh, Fred Harris, the senator from Oklahoma. Actually, when Harris said he ran, I think he ran for the Senate in 64. And essentially, he said he ran, it was, it was Johnson Harris. He said he ran, he grabbed on to Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson, he swept into office in 64 on Johnson's coattail. So they were good friends. You know, they were from Oklahoma and Texas. They talked the same language. Um, so uh, yeah, and same accent. <laughs> um, so uh, Harris was going over to the White House a lot. And he goes over to the White House one night. And, and Johnson also hates Lindsay. He thinks Lindsay's using this as a platform to launch a bid for a president to run against him in 1968. So um, Johnson looks at uh, Fred and he says, uh, Fred, so how's your friend uh, Lindsay's campaign for president coming along? And uh, Fred says, um, Mr. President, you know, I'm your friend. Uh, and Johnson leans in, the, the Johnson treatment is like nose is like an inch away. And uh, he says, uh, well, you better be, because if you're not, I'll cut off your pecker. <laughs> 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 um, so what happens is, so the, the, the funding is a constant issue. Um, and they originally, they had this $100,000, they did another $100,000, but it wasn't going to become nearly enough. Ginsburg turned in a budget of $3.5 So um, So they agree, the, 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 they agree in October that there's going to be a supplemental. They're going to go to Congress for a supplemental in December. Well, uh, Joe Calfano, the White House domestic policy advisor, uh, Charles Schultz, the, um, the uh, head of um, budget, uh, the, uh, wasn't the Bureau of the Budget, but the uh, budget director, went to Johnson and, and they had it all worked out. So they would give him this extra money. And Johnson says no. So in December, he essentially cuts off the budget of the commission. So the commission was originally supposed to turn its report in, an, in a year. It was supposed to turn in a report the following July. 
But they, Johnson assumed that when he cut their budget and they had no money left, that they would go out of business and it would just be the end of it. But instead, what they do is they lay off the entire staff, uh, all the field teams, lots of other people, and a handful of people, I mean, probably seven people write this report, working day and night for, for weeks on end. Um, so the language that comes here is not um, uh, language that, you know, that was careful, carefully thought out. It was actually, it came from two aides of John Lindsay. The, the uh, separate but equal came from uh, two aides of John Lindsay. And the other, the language about white racism came from a guy named Jack Rosenthal, uh, who was a uh, former editor uh, who came in. So, um, you know, we, when we see these documents, you know, we think of them as they're, they're written in stone. They're like the product of deliberations. And, and a lot of them are. But a lot of it is also just improvising. And after Johnson cut their budget, a handful of people got together and actually wrote this, the, the, the final report. And the final report was toned down time and time again to appease a Thornton, but Thornton almost didn't sign it. Um, at the last minute, so they, they have a ceremony where they're going to bring in the press, and they're all at a table with their copies in front of them. And, um, and it had all been agreed that they were going to sign it, but they were going to sign it in front of the media. And Thornton says, I can't sign this. Um, you know, this doesn't, there's too much in here that I don't agree with. So Lindsay said, you know, I, I'm not going to sign it either because I made a lot of compromises and there's a lot of things in here that I don't agree with. So Ginsburg, you know, I'm sure even lawyers get nervous, right? <laughs> um, uh, Ginsburg, you know, talked them down and essentially said, you know, we will have nothing. Um, if we agreed on this, you all agreed to this. Get out your pens and sign the damn thing. Um, and, and they did. Uh, but even at the last minute, it almost never came to be. But they're also baked into all of that. You know, so it, and this is something, you, you're one of your earlier books, I think, about the, sort of the peril of reform in a way. The, um, that but a, what seems like a reform process, the many different ways that it can become an, not an effective reform process. But so you end up with that. Uh, you know, kind of an extraordinary story of how the factions represented there do finally agree to go along with, with this thing. At the same time, though, uh, it's somewhat dead on arrival uh, that the, because the president's not going to uh, impose it on anybody. In fact, he's going to run away from it as fast as he can in, in many respects. Um, and the, the parties to it, while they want people to listen to it, they're going to they're gonna shape it in their own ways. But also just this fundamental thing that the Blue Ribbon Commission model, you know, probably going back to you know, the, the people on the Mayflower probably formed a committee at some point com coming over to work out some problem. Uh, but the, the Blue Ribbon Commission model works if the constituents to the commission have essentially agreed that, okay, whatever they come back with, we're going to accept. That's the power of the Blue Ribbon. And that's what takes it out of politics. Everybody's yeah. agreed ahead of time that we're going to let these, these, these dispassionate, well-intentioned experts who we all respect and who represent a variety of views. And whatever they come back with, we're just going to accept it. Um, but instead, it's the opposite of that. And then the other element that you talk about to some degree in the book is that, you know, Stokely Carmichael's not on the commission, you know, or that the, the, what is right. suddenly taking over the, the message of the civil rights movement uh, of the of, of black radical thinking, yeah. far more militant than Dr. King, uh, is not really represented here. Yeah. And obviously, Stokely Carmichael would right. never have gone along right. with, um, right. uh, with these findings. Funny story about Stokely Carmichael is when the report came out, he says, they're saying what I say, I, I say and I'm in jail. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <it>. no, yeah. right. <laughs> so the thing about Johnson is, so when, uh, uh, when the report is finished, they had uh, negotiated with the White House where they'd have a ceremony. And they'd bring all the cameras in and, and they'd present it to Johnson. But Johnson wanted nothing to do with this report. So when Ginsburg called over the White House and he said, how would you like me to deliver the report? He was told, drive by the White House and throw it over the fence. <laughs> um, so when Johnson eventually, he never accepts the report, never accepts it. He refuses to sign letters to the commissioners for their service. Not even, not, these aren't letters that, you know, that say, I love what you did. It's just like, thank you for spending this much time working on a commission I appointed you to, even though you don't get paid any money. Um, he. Uh, refused to talk about it in the media. He just completely disowned uh, this report. Um, 
and you know, it gives you a sense of Johnson's psyche. And I, you know, and I, I write about this in the book, and I'm sympathetic to Johnson in a way. This is 1968. Um, the Republicans and conservative Democrats, remember there's this block of most of the Democrats who are still Southern and very conservative. And you had enough Republicans now after the 66 congressional elections that they're cutting back on his programs. And here this commission comes in and actually calls for uh, a dramatic expansion. The, the White House did all these, they obviously took the report apart and issued uh, recommendations and they, they briefed Johnson on what's in it. And essentially the, what they said is, it's everything we want to do, but on steroids. Um, it's, they, you know, it's their same programs that we want. They want more of them. They want to spend more money. And, uh, but the commission did not put a dollar recommendation on all these different proposals that they were recommending. And that just infuriated Johnson. So in some ways, and you know, if the so I, you know, where I came down on this, so there, as Doug said, there were three parts to the report. What happened? That was the easy part. Just a narrative uh, analysis of what happened in, in, in the main, in Newark and Detroit. The second was why did it happen? And they never really resolved that to any satisfaction. But the most contentious issues were what do we do to prevent them from happening again? And this, these are policy recommendations that, uh, that they, they were making. And they were the most contentious, the things they fought over the most. They were also the things that, uh, that uh, angered Johnson the most. So some people on the commission, who I tend to agree with, believe that what they should have done is instead of listing these, these, all these detailed recommendations for things that they've only been studying for a couple of months, um, that they could have put those in an appendix um, and had a much brief, briefer thing about what we need to do about, we need to form some kind of national unity, we need to have discussion about these things, they're complicated, but we need to overcome racism. Um, and so that all these expensive programs, which became the focus of, of the report, uh, could have been left aside. The power of the report was in the words that Doug read. It was the condemnation of white racism, uh, the, um, the recognition that we were becoming two separate societies. And that should have been what the focus was on. But what they, the commissioners unintentionally did by including so many recommendations was to give critics something to hang on to. Mm. Like, where is the $30 billion going to come from to pay for all these programs? Which is a fair question to ask. But what the book also does is, I think it's quite unusual, uh, just because the opportunity to do it does, usually doesn't exist, but that you do take the reader uh, into uh, tremendous detail about you know, what exactly is this dialogue. Not this, too much detail. I know. Right? I, I didn't say excruciating. Yeah, I was, um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the, it really is. It's the sausage factory, though. I mean, you get to see how this thing is made. But so, you, you know, we, we sort of see this interaction uh, and the debate among these characters, and it's, it's sort of unusual, particularly in a pre-recording uh, pre of everything era, you know, to, to get a window into that. But what it also, uh, I think, captures is that we have a little bit of an illusion now, particularly younger people, about what the 1960s was. Yeah. Uh, that, this idea that it's the age of Aquarius, and it's when Dr. King comes along, and, the, uh, and America realizes you know, how wrong it's been about race, and these things get fixed, and so Rights Act occurs, uh, and, all the, and it's part of this simplistic narrative that says, and then everything was great, you know, that, uh, uh, and, and has been since. And, uh, and of course, we know that's not how it's turned out. I taught you, you made reference to this earlier, and interestingly enough, the, the film that Bill mentioned at the beginning that uh, I've been working on called The Harvest, uh, when I describe that to people, I describe it as that it's a, uh, an investigation into what I term the central paradox in American life. And the central paradox is that over the last 50 years, we've made so much progress, like you were describing at the beginning, uh, just unbelievable progress, you know, unimaginable at the time, a right. uh, 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 degree of progress. And yet, we remain the society that if, you know, if we got word right now that some terrible thing was happening in Richmond or in Charlottesville, uh, none of us would be particularly surprised if there was suddenly some civil disturbance. And so we've, we're the most racially advanced and equitable society that has existed in American history. There's no doubt about that. Sure. You know, Absolutely. And yet, yeah. uh, and yet we all sort of expect some terrible thing like the Newark riots to happen tomorrow. We're, we're sort of anticipating it. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, when it comes to presidential commissions, first of all, and I'll get to the main point of your, your, um, your comments, but uh, I, I spent 
years working on this, and I came to the conclusion that presidential commissions aren't always a good idea. Um, they, they work well when you're dealing with a very specific topic, um, a technical topic that doesn't have built-in constituencies. But uh, one of the problems with the commission is that, you know, it's, it, there was hubris. Um, and they believed, they really believed that they could, with a presidential report, change the nature of race relations in America. And, uh, and that's naive. And on, on a topic as confounding and complex as race, um, a president, there's nothing a presidential commission is ever going to say. And I end the book with a quote from um, Kenneth Clark, who did the famous studies for the Brown v. v. Board decision. And he said, it's, these presidential commissions are like Alice in Wonderland. You know, they just, it's the same story over and over again. So after every major uh, uprising, there is a commission. The commission talks about these horrible uh, conditions and things have to be done. And there's sort of a heightened awareness for a week, two weeks, maybe a month. And then it just disappears. And, and, and the Kerner Commission fell and suffered that same fate. Um, in terms of today, um, I think what we talk about today, um, it's complicated by, by the person who's in the White House. Um, because... Uh, Tell us <laughs> something we don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's... Um, and I think one of the mistakes that I made, and I think a lot of people made, was that we, when uh, Obama won in 2008, and then won under very difficult circumstances, re-election in 2012, we had um, greater confidence in the amount of racial progress we had made in America. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why there was so much complacency in 2016. Um, and so I don't think that the regime that's in power now, what, which has in, in itself empowered the type of people who invaded Charlottesville a year ago, are really representative of where we are as a nation when it comes to race. And I think that when this period passes, uh, that we will find that um, the loud voices that we are hearing now, the loud, shrill voices, uh, are a very distinct minority. Um, and that, uh, that the uh, approach of this president will end up in the same place as the Soviet Union, what Ronald Reagan called the ash heap of history. I didn't, make, I didn't want to be partisan or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, it's, uh, I think that's a, a very interesting way of tying these things together. Um, I also think, though, if we go back and look more specifically at the, at the period of time, that it strikes me that the Kerner Commission and understanding it better uh, is another way of seeing, uh, for one, uh, the kind of um, miraculous, tragic happenstance of that, the truth is, John F. Kennedy was instinctively very aware of the issues that were going to confound uh, the Kerner Commission uh, years after his death. Uh, he was very aware that uh, when he first confronted uh, the riot in Oxford, Mississippi on the campus of Ole Miss, uh, he desperately did not want to send in U.S. troops because Eisenhower, having sent troops to, to Little Rock in 1957, had, been, had become something of an albatross hung around Eisenhower's neck in the sense that this, this terrible violation and antagonism of these forces uh, that were out there. He resisted, resisted, finally did send troops to Oxford. It actually accelerated into an even larger spectacle and people died. Uh, so Kennedy was very aware, very timid. Dr. King was uh, on race up to that point. Dr. King wouldn't go to the White House because he thought that uh, Kennedy, for a long time, because he thought Kennedy was, uh, didn't want to be window dressing for the president. But what all of that reflected was to some degree uh, that uh, the degree to which President Kennedy, I think, actually saw the, the treacherous uh, minefield of American thinking around these things, even though he was in for a Boston white guy who'd probably barely ever known any black people, uh, he, uh, he actually was in a pretty good place on, on race. And then he's inspired by events to make uh, a right. very powerful speech. But it is his death, you know, that it's, and, if you, and I think if you look at all this, you realize that, okay, it's not just that, that the Civil Rights Act could have occurred only 
in the aftermath of an event like his assassination as a sort of tribute yeah. to him, which I think it was. Um, but it also, I think we see through this that how quickly things break down, right. uh, and that and that these fundamental attitudes yeah. that you know just begin to prevail that yeah. uh, that you just can only go so far. Yeah. So I think you know with Kennedy, I think one of the, my favorite presidential addresses was the speech Kennedy gave on June 11th, uh, 1963, 62, 63, where he uh, uh, he went on national TV and. Uh, and announced that he was sending the civil rights, what would become the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 to, uh, to Congress. And there's a great story behind the speech. He, he decides to do it that afternoon. Sorensen's writing a draft. Um, he, the speech is at 8 o'clock. It's not finished. And Kennedy goes on and ad-libs a good portion of the speech. And this is where he says, the first president ever to say that civil rights was a moral issue. And he says that, you know, who among us would want to have the color of their skin changed? So the evolution of the, of the, from Kennedy himself in the three years that he was in office, from being timid, calling for calling, uh, cooling off periods. Um, but you have to realize that the, the, the whole the structure of our the political system in which he operated is so different from what it is today. You know, Kennedy won a higher percentage of the vote in Georgia than he did in Massachusetts. I mean, the South was the the foundation of the Democratic Party. So if you're a Democratic president, you know, you don't want to alienate the, 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 the constituency that is most loyal to your party. So it's, it took a lot of courage. It took an enormous amount of courage for Kennedy and of course Johnson. And you know, Johnson made the famous quip that, went, that he's just given away the South for the rest of the century. He didn't realize that no, it goes into the next century too. Um, but, uh, but uh, so we, the decade begins with, uh, you know, this, this sense of momentum. I mean, uh, driven by the freedom struggle, driven by African Americans on the ground in these communities, forcing change, uh, wanting to be as dream, as King said. You know, want the American dream, the the, the African American dream was also the American dream, um, and then politicians against great odds uh, begin to respond. Um, and then by the end of the decade, you know, by the time the, the, the commission report comes out, when the commission report comes out, Richard Nixon, who was planning on running for president in 68 as a high-minded foreign policy specialist to a deal with Vietnam, realizes there's an opening here. So I spent time talking to his speechwriter, Pat Buchanan, um, who, uh, and I, Pat Buchanan has, uh, his papers are at the Reagan Library, and you just see it, you see it, this, this, uh, this effort to tap into the anxieties of white Americans. I mean, it begins, obviously, Goldwater does it in 64. Uh, Wallace is out there doing it in a more direct way. But Nixon is the one who adds this element to his appeal. And Nixon had been a racial moderate for most of his life. And, and I think if you want to understand what's taking place today, it's, it is the uh, effort uh, among mainstream Republicans to um, absorb into their message um, the, uh, the appeal to uh, the frustrations of white Americans who are upset with a lot of things uh, in the 1960s, but especially about race. Uh, and I think that has become one of the central messages. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons why we've had this complete change in our the, the, the structure of our politics and the structure of our parties. I mean, there's a reason why the white South, which was solidly Democratic, is now solidly Republican. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons, I believe, is that is this backlash. And I think that um, we have, since 1968, despite all the events that have taken place, lots of, lots of things that, that are separate from race, completely separate from race, we have been living in an age of cultural backlash that I think has peaked um, over the past couple of years. Let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, so I, I take easy questions and compliments. <laughs> so, I see one there. So, uh, actually, pa pause for a second. Let's, uh, uh, and let's, uh, He's got a pretty good voice the there. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. The, we just want, we'll get the, we'll bring a microphone over to you so they can capture the audio. Uh, and if you do have a question uh, after this, gentleman, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll try to hold back the hordes. 
Yes, you, you talked about uh, LBJ's reaction to this commission report. What about a society as evidenced by the journalists or the people? What were they saying? Were they just dismissing it as, oh yes, another commission report? Or were they talking a lot about it in the first weeks? They were talking about it and it split along cultural lines that we're very familiar with today. So elite uh, newspapers, uh, I mean, New York Times, um, Washington Post, LA Times, all praised it. Um, small uh, newspapers, especially in the South, uh, critiqued it, uh, criticized it. Um, uh, liberals, a handful of liberals embraced it. Most kept their distance from it. Uh, conservatives used it as ammunition. I mean, politically, I believe in the short run and, and in the long run, it backfires uh, because so, it, it emboldens um, those who want to um, critique uh, the great society. And this whole language about law and order and this, that Demo uh, Democrats being soft on, on crime. Um, and uh, it all sort of, it, this feeds that critique and, and empowers it in a way that probably would not have been empowered had the report never been written. And if you're able to stand up while you ask your question, the, so the guys can broadcast you out on the internet, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how much did the commission make the connection between white racism as a kind of palliative because it became a way, white racism as I understand it was used as a way to sort of paper over economic problems so that basically you gave a white consciousness if you were poor, you brought poor whites, poor whites were brought on board because they were white and they didn't have to worry about them being poor. So it was a way to sort of avoid having an economic conversation. And uh, as a result, there was a whole set of conversations that didn't happen around connecting economic development yeah. and wealth creation. Yeah. And arguably one of the sort of underlying challenges now is the perception that bringing other people up means I have to lose my place. Yeah. And that remains yeah. a continuing issue. That's a great point. That's very much a part of the conversation today. It was not part of the conversation in 1967 and 1968. <clears throat> you know, where there was a period of, tr we, this was a period of enormous economic growth. Um, and uh, not once on the commission is there any parallel made between um, uh, economic disadvantage and, and racism. And the white racism was not used to, to try to avoid having that conversation. I think the problem with white racism is it just hangs out there. Uh, they don't name names. They don't identify how institutions, how people unwittingly contribute to, to racism. It was simply uh, f uh, two words uh, that are in the, in the introduction and buried somewhere in the report. So I think that if there's a failing with white racism is that they did not explore it as a concept and use it as an organizing theme uh, because it was really added at the very end. But there's very little, um, you know, I think that this whole issue of economic inequality, obviously it's existed forever, but it accelerates really beginning in the 70s. I think globalization, uh, uh, you see the so beginning in the 70s and it, in, the, in the 20th century, especially after the collapse in 2008, um, it becomes even more severe and, and now is a part of, of their national conversation. It wasn't then. But it's also interesting, a really interesting point, I think, though, that, uh, uh, that you were referring to, that the establishing that, uh, that the primary words are white racism and, that, and even going back to President Kennedy referring to uh, racism as a moral issue, uh, but that whole establishment of that, uh, it, it, it did pave the way for an approach to race for the country, I think. Uh, I think it's a fair assessment, where, whatever political perspective you have, that it established that basically if I stop thinking bad thoughts, then that's enough. You know, if I don't use the N-word anymore, if I, if I treat the black people I know more respectfully, uh, then I, mean, I, can, I can almost, I was trying to describe it to someone last night in a conversation, I can almost remember the day in the little town in Mississippi where I grew up. I, I can't pin it down, but I, I can sort of imagine I can remember the day where the day before it was actually perfectly fine for people to use the N-word uh, in front of you know, anybody else and at church and you know, any sort of setting. And then the day after, it was impolite. Mm -hmm. uh, it had become, that was a coarse thing to do. And even if you, even, no matter how you felt, you weren't supposed to do that anymore. And so then the levers of politeness began to grind a little bit yeah. on, on. You think the report had something to do with that? Well, it's this idea though, that, yeah. the, that in the end, the, because it does seem that the report breaks down the, 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 the recommendations of it, of that 
uh, it turns out that because it did wrestle with some of these economic issues the, the, yeah. through the recommendations, that but that was what the country really couldn't you know just couldn't proceed on, yeah. and it was getting distracted with Vietnam and other things. Yeah. But that's the, I think that's still the central dilemma for Americans that we're comfortable with the idea that yeah people should not have bad thoughts about yeah. people because of what they look like, but oh we should really <laughs> aggressively try to reckon with the legacies and that are yeah. economic and that maybe will cost yeah. more in taxes and things, that's where it all breaks down yeah. and it has broken down over and over again, I think. Yeah, I just think one of the failures of the commission is, and it's understandable why, it never, it became a topic of discussion among elite opinion makers yeah. and never really had sort of, it never, never had this kind of traction with, uh, with everyday Americans. It just simply did not, uh, it, People debated it on, you know, in, in newspapers, and uh, but I don't think it ever sort of seeped down to change any attitudes yeah. um, uh, of Americans. Let's go to the lady in the center there at the back, and then we'll come around. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm really looking forward to uh, reading your book. Um, so. I'm curious, you said that some of the field reporters um, or field investigators during the Kerner Commission, when they interviewed all these folks in all these different cities, they found that the common thread was um, that those in the community engaged in the um, unrest and the riots were either victims of pre police brutality or had seen it, had witnessed right. it. So if that was brought out more strongly in the Kerner Commission, do you think that that could have um, created more uprising because there would have been truth to that type of power that the police had over the people? And my second piece is, do you feel that um, there has been progress made in the last 10 years or so uh, for African American men being so significantly uh, mass incarcerated, and if that is holding back progress? Uh, two very good questions. Um, I told you I only take easy ones. <laughs> um, so I think one of the impacts that the Kerner Commission did have uh, was in law enforcement. Uh, and there is a real effort um, after 1968. Uh, the, uh, a number of police organizations meet with members of the commission. They take their recommendations seriously uh, and they incorporate them. So you see, certainly in major cities, police departments ha developing much better methods uh, for dealing with unrest. Um, the problem is one of the, the central recommendations that the, that the commission had was that the police not be militarized, uh, that, um, that you do, there's more, uh, policing on the ground, and that when events take place, there are ways of controlling without bringing in tanks. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened, I think it started in the beginning of the century, uh, police departments started buying all this equipment from, from the war in Iraq, uh, and even small little departments, you know, where the biggest crime is someone steals candy, they have a tank. <laughs> um, so I think the trend, there was a positive impact of the commission on, on policing. I think it's, 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 we're going backwards in some ways. Um, so, uh, and about whether or not they had included that in the report, um, it was never, it could, it would never have, it would, they would never have had a unanimous report with that in it. Uh, there were discussions about that. Um, and in an earlier draft, they didn't say exactly that, but they, it was very critical of the police and placed a lot of responsibility on the police. All that is edited out in order to please Thornton. Um, and uh, are we making progress now? You know, we're having this conversation now, uh, which we never did not have before. And I think that in and of itself is a sign of progress. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, I'm interested in the conflicted character of Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, why was he so hostile? Why didn't he see it as a tool to push great society programs? Because he, Johnson's trapped in 1968. Um, and he's trapped by this conservative coalition of Democrats and uh, Republicans. Uh, they're scaling back on, they're cutting his budget. Uh, they're scaling back on great society programs. Uh, so uh, the idea of 
proposing a whole series of new initiatives that would cost, the estimate was $30 billion, at a time when Congress was cutting his budget, was just not feasible. Um, so, uh, so you know, the commission was aware of that, and they argued, and it's a fair argument to make, which is they were making a, a point for, uh, for, for, uh, for the future. They were setting up a, a, a marker for where we should be, even if it wasn't going to be possible in the last couple of years of Johnson's administration. The problem is, as we all know, is that we've never had that opportunity again. Um, uh, the 60s, I mean, even so Obama, the, you know, Clinton is a moderate uh, liberal on things, but doesn't launch any new uh, social programs. Uh, first of all, you have you know, the stagflation in the 70s, you have Nixon, um, you have Jimmy Carter's the most conservative Democrat in the 20th century. Um, then you have Reagan and Bush, and then Clinton comes in, and he's kind of, uh, he's not pushing for major new social programs, and obviously uh, with the war in, in Iraq, Bush isn't doing it, not that he would have done it anyway. And Obama is the one who, you know, would be most likely to do it, but he comes in, he's dealing with this economic crisis. So I wonder, and I didn't ask this question. If I could go back to, I, I would, and this sort of you inspired something. I would just go back and ask them, knowing what they know now, would they still have made those recommendations? If they knew that this was the last moment of significant change. And it's one thing I've, I've thought about a lot. It's like you look about, you look at uh, this, the, the amount of uh, social change that we've had, political change that we've had. And we have these, we have long periods of, of conservative governance and short bursts of reform. Uh, so you take the 20th century, for example. So you have, say, you know, three years under Teddy Roosevelt. You have uh, the first term of Woodrow Wilson, although the war actually in, unintentionally creates a lot of social, a lot of uh, change. You have the first, you have Roosevelt until 36, uh, another four years. Then you have Johnson from 64 to 66. So of the 100 years in the 20th century, you have maybe 12, 13 years where there's actually social reform. And I, my theory is this, is that, that um, uh, Godfrey Hodgson has this great statement, Americans love change, but they hate to be changed. Um, and uh, to me, it's what has happened, especially since World War II, is that we have come to expect the benefits that government provides without acknowledging the legitimacy of the federal government. Um, so we, when there's, a, when there's a, a crisis, the first question is, what's the president going to do? Um, but during, when there's not a crisis, the idea is that's, you know, we're going to cut waste and fraud out of the government. And waste and fraud is what the benefit you get. What I get is hard earned. Um, and that's because we don't acknowledge the, the, the legitimacy, legitimacy of the federal government to make these kinds of decisions. So there's this gap between our expectations of what government should do and our acknowledgement of the legitimacy of that government. Um, and I think that is really the sort of the, the tension that has defined our view of government since the 1950s. So it's not, it's not Arthur Schlesinger's idea of a pendulum. Um, it's a constant source of tension that exists uh, throughout and moves uh, slightly in one direction or another. But we, you know, we are, um, you know, these famous political scientists said back in the 50s, and I think it's so true, although I don't usually believe political scientists, <laughs> um, that uh, Americans are philosophically conservative and operationally liberal. You know, we're a nation that was born in revolt against a foreign power. We believe in individual rights. We believe in local government. We believe in self-help. All these are very conservative ideas, ideals. And I think they run, they're a part of our DNA. Um, but most of the times that we have dramatically expanded government have been in response to crisis. Industrialization and urbanization under uh, uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson, the crisis of the Great Depression under Franklin Roosevelt. The 1960s was the only time, two years, from 64 to 66, was the only time that we, we uh, expanded the role of government out of a sense of optimism. Uh, and we haven't done it since. <laughs>